This is Christopher Cernike hosting episode 22 of season 3 of the Current Topics in Science podcast. This podcast will address breaking scientific news in light of the origins debate and host interviews with scientists. This podcast is available on the following platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Video recordings of the podcast will be uploaded to YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Today on Current Topics in Science, we have the honor of hosting Charlie Walcott. This is the first part in a four-part series with Charlie. Charlie studied computer science at the University of Texas at El Paso, and he's certified to teach math and physics for both middle and high school. He's also a graduate from the Sharp Institute for Biblical Worldview Studies of the Creation Truth Foundation, where he was commissioned to teach about the importance of having a biblical worldview. Charlie has always had a passion for the Lord, and he was raised in the mission field. He's helped his parents for over two decades as they served with international family missions, and he's the leader of a Bible study group at his church. He's also a member of Worldview Warriors, and he speaks at conferences, church events, and Christian schools. He's a teacher and an author of several books, such as 10 Reasons to Believe the Bible and The God of the Psalms. Charlie has Asperger's Syndrome, which is a high-functioning form of autism. When he was six years old, he was told that he'd never run, and that he'd probably never live on his own, drive, or go to college. His testimony did not turn out that way, though, as he's currently teaching AP Physics, which is considered to be one of the most difficult of all AP classes. And so by grace, Charlie has done all of these things and more to the glory of God. And now, without further ado... Good afternoon, Charlie. How was your day, and how are you doing? Been doing great. Uh, great, to, great, great to be on board with you, and uh, uh, great to, ha- to have this uh, have this interview. It's always a pleasure to have you on, Charlie. And since this is current topics in science, we're going to quickly look at this week's current topic. In each part of this four part series, we're going to be looking at an article called "Radiometric Dating Puts Pieces of the Past in Context." Here's how. The article begins with this opening, which reads, When a researcher picks up an object, whether it's a scrap of leather from a dig site, a fossil from a museum drawer, or a newly fallen meteorite, their first question might be, what is this thing? And a natural follow-up, how old is it? The first question is fundamental, no doubt, but the second is powerful too. It helps place the object in its proper archaeological, geological, or cosmological context. Without knowing the ages of things, there is no narrative, says Rick Potts, a paleoanthropologist at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. So, Charlie, this article, it seems to be indicating that the long ages are connected to a narrative. And so that begs the question, naturally, what is the narrative that radiometric dating methods are working to uphold? Yeah, uh, I found this quote to be very, very interesting. Uh, and uh, and as I read the article uh, to uh, to get the full context, uh, 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 Rick Potts here uh, makes a very true statement: without knowing the age of things, there is no narrative. And so he's asking the question, "How old is it?" And th- and um, I- I'm going to say that this is not just a fundamental question about science; it's a fundamental question about life. Okay, and so. If we don't know the age of things, uh, there's no narrative. But and, and as you ask, what is the narrative? And so, uh, what are these scientists really going after? And the real question that they're going after is the question: Where did I come from? This question is about origins, and it's something that every person asks in some way, shape, or form. Okay, and so everyone's asking: Where did I come from? Uh, what's my past? What's my history? And so, uh, so I, yeah. So I love this quote. It's a great opener for the series. And so, uh, as I've been, as I've written for World Wars and as I've spoken about a variety of topics, uh, one of the things I teach about is, is on worldviews. What is a worldview, and uh, how does it affect our lives? And uh, the way I address it is that I, I address five major questions that every person asks in some way, shape, or form. Those questions are: Where did I come from? Why am I here? 
Who am I? Where am I going? And who do I listen to? Now, there are other versions of these questions, uh, other worldview type questions that, that people might ask, such as, well, what's wrong with this world? Or how can uh, what is wrong be made right? Uh, Bodhi Bakum has a very powerful sermon called uh, the, the Supremacy of Christ uh, in Truth in, in, the, in the Postmodern Age, where he addresses uh, those two questions. But, but like, what's wrong with this world is also addressed in our origins, where did we come from? And all these questions, all these worldview questions are can, have to be answer, answered holistically. Okay, so you can't uh, uh, answer where do we come from without also addressing who are we, why are we here, uh, where are we going, and what's our authority on all these topics. Okay, so all of these are answered holistically. And then, uh, and then when I go on these teachings, I address like how, so how are these questions answered, and and, and, I, and I look at the overall worldviews primarily comparing secular humanism and biblical Christianity. And that, and this is what we're going to see in this series, that it, it really isn't science that's driving the narrative of, of the dating of the age of the earth or, or and the use of all these methods. What's really driving it is the worldview and the paradigm of the scientists doing the study. And so uh, where I would argue that Mr. Potts is wrong in this quote is that when it comes to dating methods, it's not the narrative, it's the narrative that drives the results, not the results driving the narrative. Okay, so... Uh, well, uh, what the article is going to su suggest is that uh, as we do all these studies, as we do all these uh, radiometric datings, that's what produces our narrative. And that's actually not what happens. OK, so before we get really too excited here, I want to define a few terms here that we're going to be addressing, uh, namely like uh, in the worldviews that, that, that are involved in the discussion of radiometric dating. So we, we have two major worldviews. OK, we have uh, uh, evolution. And uh, evolution is not specifically Darwinian uh, evolution of uh, biological life. It's really it's the it's the overall secular humanistic uh, naturalistic worldview that things came about on their own via natural processes. Uh, they have uh, they have a variety of different submodels that are purely a uh, atheistic in model in nature. They could be deistic in nature, in which th there's a belief in a god that started it, but he's a very distant god. And then there's a theistic model, which basically attempts to to uh, cover the entire evolutionary ideas with the biblical God and describe it, that as that's how God does it. OK, so that's an overall worldview, whereas we have the creation worldview where we see uh, where, uh, where ultimately we see creative design. We see an intentional uh, designer. And, and what we ultimately conclude is that the God of the Bible uh, directly created these things in the history that he described as. And we go from there. So as we look at these models, there are preconceived ideas about origins that, that go into our, our studies. OK, and these produces some kind of biases. OK, uh, as much as people uh, would like to say otherwise, uh, there is no such thing as an unbiased scientist. It doesn't work. And so when we look at scientific data, it's all filtered through our preconceived biases regarding our origins. Uh, I want to address the the, the idea of philosophical naturalism, and then we'll move on to our next question. Okay, so philosophical naturalism is the controlling or, or operating worldview in secular science. Okay? It, uh, its major claim, it alleges that uh, nature is all there is and nothing exists outside of space or time. Okay? However, uh, this is seriously questioned or often refuted, easily refuted by the laws of thermodynamics. I teach physics. I can definitely attest to this. Philosophical naturalism assumes and then imposes the idea that a, a trans, uh, transcendental, all-intelligent, all-powerful creator does not exist. Okay? Now, there are many people who will argue, like, well, we don't make any claim about the nature of God. And that may be true, uh, that they don't actually make a claim. However, God is nowhere to be found in, in, in the realm of possibilities in all their analysis. And when we propose that, they are highly resistant to, to such a notion, okay? especially if it's the biblical God. Okay. Philosophical naturalism requires that science be conducted in a naturalistic matter and assumes that this is true for the matters of origins. Okay. And as a result of this, all scientific study, therefore, must pretend that God does not exist, or at the very least, he is not considered. Okay. He is not consulted. Okay. And, and uh, this practice is called methodological naturalism, and it really is irrational. I've had a lot of people uh, boast that they practice, they practice this. Uh, methodological naturalism, not philosophical naturalism. And I ask him, what's the difference? And we still haven't gotten any answer. 
in, in a way, I describe philosophical naturalism as a modern version of pantheism. Okay, and it's a it's a godless worship of nature. It gives nature the creative power that God has. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with. And so what we're going to find out is that as we as we look at these the radiometric dating methods, and as we look over the debate of the Earth, the issue is not really about the age of the Earth by itself, but who or what is responsible for bringing us here and creating the planet that we call home. That's really what the debate's about. And so either God created everything. Or nature did it without God. And again, some will argue that God could have created via these uh, evolutionary models, via natural methods. But the record that God gave describes something entirely different. Whereas the biblical Christian worldview uh, uh, states that the Bible is the first, final, defining, and ultimate authority on every topic it addresses. The biblical worldview sees uh, God, Jehovah, as the creator. And as the supreme being who oversees and actively monitors everything going on in creation, namely here on planet Earth. And so mankind is not the result of long years of evolution and gradual changes and gradual processes. But the biblical Christian worldview teaches that we are specifically created in the image of God to reflect his likeness. And we are held morally responsible for his choices. That's really what we are dealing with when it comes to what is our past? What is our history? and and um, How do we see what's going on here? Thank you so much, Charlie, for outlining all of the different worldviews. I'm grateful that you took the time to do that because, as you said, it is important to define terms before we move on. And actually, before we do that, I want to just throw in a little quick comment. Like, as you were talking, I thought about how, you know, at one point in time, like, philosophical and methodological naturalism were not the dominant consensus view of scientists at one point the scientists were all bible believing men and women who were working in their minds they, they're glorifying god with what they did yeah and uh the the the, the whole idea of, of the, like the whole naturalistic approach it, it's an outflow of the enlightenment of the 1700s and came into prominence with the the, the deistic movement in the 1800s okay and uh and uh, we'll address in a few minutes uh, how guys like Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin were heavily influential about this. But I'll also add a, add a caveat is that th- even though th- this became predominant in the last 200 years, it's not anything new. We see these ideas all the way back in Greek and ancient Near East and uh, Hindu I- I- ideologies. OK, so they haven't um, they really haven't moved on from the gods of the ancient Near East. They just replaced the gods with scientific laws. <laughs> They're still worshiping nature. Wow. So thank you, Charlie, for expounding on the narrative behind radiometric dating. And while we're on the subject of narrative, meaning, and truth, I want to share with you this quote from the University of California, Berkeley. They had this very interesting comment on the overall purpose of science as a whole. They said that the aim of science is to build true and accurate knowledge about how the world works. So, Charlie, what I'm hearing them say is that science's aim or build is trying to find this truth and knowledge. Do you agree with them? Essentially, what is the fundamental principle upon which all of science is based? Yeah, so what, what, I, uh, what, what I'm hearing them saying is that science becomes an a, a epistemology. A sor- it's a source and a study of truth. And... Um, that's not entirely true. Uh, uh, Charles Jackson uh, was in a debate with a bunch of evolutionists, and, and I think you've had the privilege of interviewing him. And uh, he quoted uh, Richard uh, uh, Feynman saying, like, uh, 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 science is the, the, the search for truth. And then the whole panel just kind of erupted with him and saying, like, it's not, a, it's not a search for truth. It's a discussion. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah, but it's... Science is not true. Science is not an epistemology. It's a tool. It's a very valuable tool. It's a very awesome tool, but it's a tool. And, uh, and, and we have, so we have to understand what science is, what science is not. Okay. Science is a great way. We, it's a great tool that we have to discover how God designed this universe. And the secularists will say like, this is how, uh, what, what nature used to create itself. And, uh, and I'm like, wait a second. Uh, I teach physics, basic laws of for uh, ba- basic Newton's laws. Uh, a f- object cannot create, cannot make itself move. 
Okay, it takes an external force to do that. That's basic fundamental physics. <laughs> I teach this in high school. <laughs> okay, and, and yet these PhDs come up with all these really crazy ideas because they will not give God <laughs> a, a place <laughs> in the discussion. Okay, so uh, what are the fundamental principles behind of which all science is, bu- uh, 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 all science is built? Okay, so uh, again, the foundation is, the, the real foundation is the worldview that we are looking at. Is God the master of this universe or is nature the master of this universe? Okay, so I mentioned how we talked about the enlightenment and, uh, and the deists of the 1800s. But one of the big ideas that came out of this enlightenment, m- m- enlightenment period is the idea of uh, uniformitarianism, okay? And we've ver- heard this phrase, the, key, the present is key to the past, okay? That's a very good, uh, uh, and um, so, I mean, th- th- this is something that is just drilled into the minds of scientists and uh, anyone in who goes through science education in, to any kind of degree. Now, we have to be careful here. Let's not confuse this term with uniformity of nature because they are not the same thing. So uniformity of nature states that the scientific laws that we've discovered the, the laws themselves do not change. Apart and and uh, and uniform in nature does allow for miracles from God. Okay, uniformitarian, however, is, is is explicitly teaching that the rates at which nature has been observed to take place today are the same as for all eternity. Okay, and so uh, uniformity of nature states that my velocity is my distance divided by time. Okay, or speed is distance divided by time. Uniformitarianism is a teaching that I travel at the same velocity for the entire time of my analysis. Okay, that's the big difference. And uh, th- there are a number of uh, uh, old earth creationists who uh, are hev- heavily object to this definition, but that's the one that was uh, put together by a guy named Charles Lyell, who is the known as the father of modern historical geology. Charles Lyell was not a, a scientist. Okay, he was a lawyer. He was trained by is a trained as a lawyer. He, he practiced lawyer at, for for his career, and so and so he was an amateur geologist. Uh, he he, he uh, I'm not I don't remember what position he had, but he he basically was part of the uh, uh, London Geological Society, which which was a bunch of amateurs. They really did not know what they were doing. Okay, I just put but okay, uh, they were kind of making these up as they go. But it's really un- critical to understand Charles Lyell because he is the one who influenced Darwin. OK, uh, Darwin wrote that half of his thoughts resided in Lyell's head. OK, one of the things that non people realize Lyell was Darwin's mentor. OK, uh, it wasn't just Darwin read Lyell's books. Uh, Lyell was Darwin's mentor. OK, Lyell was the one who, hit, who got Darwin to get his book Oranges of Species published. And it was Lyell who, who, present, who uh, presented the cliche, the present is key to the past. By analyzing rates that we are measuring today. And, and extrapolating that to many, many years in the past. He's most famous for his uh, studies on, on the uh, erosion rates of Niagara Falls, but any study of Niagara Falls will show that Lyell actually lied about his findings. Because the local reporters, uh, uh, he asked the locals uh, what the erosion rate was, and, and one of the guys he came across was a, was a local drunkard. And he said, oh, about three to five meters per year. And then Lyell recorded it to be one meter per year. Uh, Ian Juby, who has done some uh, incredible studies in, in, um, he, uh, uh, on this topic, uh, he's uh, nearing completion of his. Uh, he, he has this mega long series called Complete Creation, and he's in the process of uh, of nearing the end of, of releasing this third edition on YouTube. But he, he takes the first two to four episodes on addressing Lyell and his research because that's the foundation of all these deep time methods and ideas. Okay, and uh, when uh, when Juby was analyzing uh, what really happened at Ni- Niagara Falls. Uh, he actually calculated according to pictures and uh, drawings and stuff of the past. He was able to extrapolate the erosion rates uh, could have been up to 17 meters per year, whereas Lyell reported one and uh, one meter per year and then extrapolated backwards, saying that uh, Niagara Falls could only have been uh, uh, have been like at least 30 to 50 thousand years old, which put it in front of the uh, uh, mosaic timeline of history, and therefore Genesis was refuted. Yet it was all based on a lie. And, th- and, this, and, and these things were the foundation of modern geology and as a result, and also the foundation of radiometric dating methods. So some of the other things that, that Juby points out is, is that, uh, that we have in writing from Lyell that he had a motivation, he had a bias. His intention was to remove Moses from the history books. Okay, 
he wanted to remove Genesis 1 through 11 from being considered history. And the way he would do that is that uh, he, he came up with this idea that, that he could convince the world to reject Genesis without offending its believers by creating a different sketch of history. Okay, let me say that again. Okay, uh, uh, Lyell came up with this idea that he could convince the world to reject Genesis without offending Bible believers by creating a different sketch of history and not mentioning that he's attacking the Bible. That's the foundation behind radiometric dating methods and the whole secular idea of deep time and millions of years. Lyell was at, is at its foundation. So let's take a look at how Christians and uh, look at science and versus how seculars view, uh, uh, view science. Okay, so can we can kind of see like, uh, here's how our worldviews compare. So the Christian, we see God as the supreme authority and, he, and, and it is God who makes nature work as it does. With that in mind, God is able to and has overridden and interceded upon nature to do miracles. But these miracles are localized events. They do not overall change. They do not change the overall laws. And then the purpose of, of the Christian worldview is that all scientific, all scientific study is to reveal and glorify God. Whereas the secular worldview, uh, again, as, as defined earlier, is that nature is all there is, and therefore it is the definition of reality. So if we can't uh, define it purely by naturalistic sci by scientific processes, then it cannot be true. That's their uh, philosophy. Yeah, there's all kinds of problems with this that we do, that we just don't have time to get into today. Okay, uh, but miracles and supernatural events are not within the realm of possibilities, and and and, and they even declare that it, the prospect of, of miracles makes science impossible to do. Well, science the, well, that makes science not the right tool for analyzing those events. It doesn't refute them. It just means you're using the wrong tool. And uh, according to the secularists, uh, they do not make any formal statement upon God. Okay, so. Uh, God could exist. He couldn't exist. They 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 say they don't know. They don't care. But when it, but if you look at their analysis, there is no possibility for God, uh, and nor is, is is there any consent for what he says, and nor do they, do they consider him in any way. And uh, the uh, secular naturalists that uh, that do uh, that do uh, allow for God's existence, they will often will do their complete complete study without any input from God, and then uh, they'll say. This is how God did it. They slap his name on it as though he gave his signature of approval. I call that forging God's signature, and that's a form of dishonesty, if not plagiarism. Okay, so, so, so those are the kind of the fundamentals, uh, the fundamental um, uh, principles behind what we're going to be dealing with as we deal with radiometric dating. So thank you for addressing. And now that we've covered the fundamental principles of science, let's take a look at the different categories of science. Ernest Meyer, an evolutionary biologist, said, for example, Darwin introduced historicity into science. Evolutionary biology, in contrast with physics and chemistry, is a historical science. The evolutionist attempts to explain events and processes that have already taken place. Laws and experiments are inappropriate techniques for the exploitation of such events and processes. Instead, one constructs a historical narrative consisting of a tentative reconstruction of the particular scenario that led to the events one is trying to explain. So Charlie, how are we to differentiate the different categories of science? How do we differentiate between experimental science and forensic science? I love that quote because Ernst Meyer is considered one of the uh, foremost authorities about evolution in, in the um, in, from, from the uh, from the 20th century and so to, to hear to hear that that distinction being made by by a uh, evolutionist it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's uh, really neat because uh, the evolutionists that I engage with on social media and stuff uh, 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 they mock and ridicule us for making this distinction when I, when I'm like hey you guys make the same distinctions too <laughs> so so it, observational versus historical science, they, these are not, you, uh, they are not the same thing. They're completely different methods. Okay. So, uh, the, so there, have, there has to be a distinction, but when we deal with observational science, there, there are three key words that we, that we, that we have to have. It's got to be observable. It's got to be testable. It's got to be repeatable. Okay. So when Ken Ham keeps asking the question, were you there? 
he's addressing these key words of observational science. Okay. Did you witness it? Could you test it? Could you repeat it? Okay. And, and uh, th these operations can only occur when you're dealing with the present event. Okay. So it, it is this observational science that's responsible for technology. And so when people say that uh, if we reject evolution, therefore we reject computers, that is, there's such a big disconnect there. I'm like, how do, I, I, I do, how do you even make that connection? Okay. Where's historical science? Some key words include uh, history, forensics, and uniformity of nature. Okay. Now, historical science does not deal with present events. Okay. Historical events cannot be observed, tested, nor repeated. Okay. And uh, so when we use forensics, the only thing that forensics can do is, is evaluate whether historical claim is possible to occur. Historically, we know that George Washington crossed the Delaware River on Christmas Day in, in 1777. Science cannot prove that that happened, but science could show that it was possible for George Washington to have made that crossing. Okay, but that's as far as the science can go. Okay, so it's, it's a different process, different methodology. Okay, and again, as I mentioned, the secularists claim that they're identical, but they really don't understand scientific methodology. If they're going to make that, if you're going to say that they are identical, okay, they, they actually don't understand what the scientific method is. They don't understand what historical, uh, uh, what forensics does. So with historical science, there are three major components that we address, that, that you have to address. You, you have to know your starting conditions. How did the situation begin? You have to have the historical claim, or it could be the myth, okay, whatever it is. So what happened? What's the story? And then you have to know the ending conditions. How did it end? What's the outcome? So uh, in, in that debate with Bill Nye and Ken Evans and Bill Nye, uh, Bill Nye uh, presented uh, the, the uh, uh, CSI TV shows and saying, like, uh, we use modern science to, uh, to determine what happened in the past. And then he conf conflated uh, actual observable science with historical processes and didn't understand the actual process that the CSI teams on the TV shows go through. Okay. The Mythbusters also uh, very well um, showcase this process. So let's get take a look at it in a little more detail. So for crime scene investigations, okay, and and there's a lot of science in the crime in, in the TV shows that are definitely real, uh, not realistic. And uh, just one example is that uh, it, it, uh, the, in the in the in these uh, TV shows that uh, they like taking these very blurry um, uh, uh, video recordings, and they're able to zoom in on a single document where they can uh, can and read the fine print of, of a text of a document that's barely hanging out from a a briefcase. However, um, that actually doesn't work in the real world. Uh, the, the more you zoom in, the blurrier it gets. So, uh, so not all the science in, in those crime shows are realistic, but the process is generally pretty, uh, pr it, it, it's fair to, to use that. Okay, so when a crime is com com committed, such as a murder, uh, the crime scene investigation team seeks to find out, well, what happened? And generally, they know the starting conditions because they generally know how the human body operates. So they know what a normal, healthy human uh, beings, uh, starting conditions look like. So when a person is murdered, they can figure out, okay, they went from a healthy body to dead body. What happened in between? Okay. So they know the opening, they, they know the general opening conditions. They know the ending conditions, and then their job is to figure out what happened. But one thing that's often missed in these shows, uh, by, by those who uh, cite these as evidence for forensics is that, um, and the, the, the crime is never solved on the outside investigation. There's always some small detail they they miss or they need to find that reveals it all. But also, all these detectives they always look for eyewitness eyewitnesses first and foremost. Okay, uh, even though in in the case of a courthouse they always go to analyze whether the uh, witness is, is valid or not. But anytime someone goes to solve a crime, the first thing anyone looks for is an eyewitness. That gives them all the the biggest clues that they need to start their investigation. Now, the Mythbusters th did this even better, okay? And, 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 and I know, the Mythbusters were secular. Uh, they, they taught the, the mainstream secular models, but they actually did historical sciences uh, pretty well. And what they did, they started with the story that they were investigating. It's the story or it's the myth, okay? And so, so they, knew, they knew the starting condition, they knew the story, they knew the ending conditions. And so all they, had, all they really had to do was try to replicate the events and, and get the same results. So if they got the results as expected, that myth was confirmed. If they sought to see, uh, and if they didn't get the results, they sought, they sought to see what it would take to produce those results. 
And again, uh, even if, if confirmed, uh, their replication never actually proves that the, that, uh, that, that, that the event actually did take place. It only proved that it could take place if under pure naturalistic conditions. Okay, you, you still have to have that historical claim to say it actually did happen. Okay, so 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 that that's the main distinction between historical science and observational science. Charlie, I think that those are excellent tips to keep in mind when contemplating how to differentiate between the science categories. And to make a return to our subject, can you tell us about what different fields of science come to mind when contemplating radiometric dating? In other words, what fields of science are going to be intersecting in these methods of radiometric dating? So there's all kinds of methods that are being used to kind of date historical events, state uh, historical events or uh, historical objects or archaeology. The, 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 the biggest one right now is radiometric dating. Uh, that, that's kind of like the golden child or the, uh, the, uh, the, the gold locks or uh, whatever term you want to use to describe it. Uh, it's, it's the big one. And this is the one that you question the least uh, uh, if you're going to uh, get along with the, your the, the secular scientific uh, uh, peers. But there are many other um, uh, methods too. Uh, they use ice core dating, they use uh, tree ring dating, uh, lake varve dating, and uh, one of the ones they're using now with the advent of GPS is tectonic plate movement, and, and they use dating for that too. So uh, I'll kind of cover this in a little bit more detail in the third session. But I really want to kind of want to hit ice core dating uh, 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 first on those. Because that one's kind of fun, okay? So ice core dating operates under the principle that each layer of, of, ice, of ice, which are dark and then clear, are representations of annual layers, okay? So that so what they're saying is that uh, each pattern of uh, light, dark, light, dark is a representation of summer, winter, summer, winter, okay? And then uh, they validate this by measuring oxygen, uh, oxygen content, and then that they... Um, also validate uh, validate this by uh, radiometric dating uh, ash layers that would have fallen from uh, various volcanoes, and, um, and and using that. But are they actually annual layers? And so a friend of mine from Canada uh, sent me this picture of a uh, some kind of cabin, and I think it may, it may be a restaurant. But uh, th there's clearly about four to five feet of snow on top, each with very distinct layers. That snow happened in, within a span of less than one week. Okay, and we see the very distinct snow layers. So with that one picture alone, we have observational science that completely refutes the entire foundation of the ice core dating method of historical science. And I, I, I've had a number of, of uh, skeptics that completely object to this uh, uh, to this idea, saying like, "You're not going to be able to refute the uh, uh, years of studies with one picture." And I'm like, "Well, maybe those years of studies need to involve actual on-site investigation <laughs> about what happens when snow falls." <laughs> Okay, and so it doesn't take much to refute the, the to refute their foundational uh, uh, principles, but we're also going to find out that they really don't follow the evidence; they follow the narrative. So, uh, so th th those are a, 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 a wide variety of the different methods methods that they use. And, uh, and but but what, what, what one thing thing I'll also point out here: there's not one of them that has actually been validated independently of itself. Each one of these are used to validate each other. They use carbon dating to validate uh, uh, um, tree ring dating and, uh, or dendrochronology and vice versa. And they, they and uh, there was one article, I, I didn't save it, but it actually said in the article saying that we use carbon dating to uh, confirm tree ring dating and tree ring dating to confirm carbon dating. Um, that sounds familiar. It sounds like rocks dating fossils and fossils dating rocks. And, uh, and the, the, the secular scientists, they, they object to this. But that's what they're doing, okay? All these methods are used to to create one big circular reasoning argument. And it's amazing how they all agree with each other. And we're going to find out that the reason why they all agree with each other is because they're all made to agree by following the narrative and not by following the evidence that the methods actually produce. So it sounds like there are several fields that come to mind when you're thinking about radiometric dating. Now, as a matter of historical context, who were the scientists who came up with the idea of using radiometric dating? And how was that initial research led to all the different kinds of radiometric dating? Yeah, so uh, some, of the so some of the names that, that, were, um, that were involved here are, are mentioned in, the, in our opening article. Uh, but radioactivity itself really wasn't discovered until uh, Madame uh, Curie and her contemporaries really kind of began to, as they were investigating uranium, 
uh, kind of discovered that these things are create are actually radio uh, or are, are decaying uh, decaying radioactively. Um, and I don't have right all my sources immediately with me, uh, the actual scientists who came up with each individual method, other than uh, probably the most notable one would be uh, Willard uh, Libby, who uh, he got the Nobel uh, Prize for perfecting the, the, the carbon-14 dating or carbon dating techniques. Okay, but, uh, but historically, uh, uh, it, it was the late 1800s when they discovered uh, radioactive decay. Uh, early 1900s, um, 1920s, 1930s, when they began uh, putting... Uh, 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 putting these radioactive discoveries into uh, dating methods, and then uh, and it goes from there. So, uh, just so, so so for people who are not as scientifically uh, 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 literate as some and as as others, and that and that's okay. Not everyone is scientifically led, but so what is radioactive decay? Okay, because because this is kind of foundational to what we're what we're going into. In every atom nucleus, there, there, uh, each atom has a certain number of protons and neutrons. The number of protons determines the atomic number and, and the element, and the number of neutrons determines the, the isotope and helps give balance to the nucleus. And so, uh, there are certain isotopes uh, that have either too many protons or too few, uh, or too many neutrons or too few neutrons, and uh, that isotope becomes unstable and it's going to decay or break down into a more uh, stable isotope. Okay, so we call this unstable one a parent. And the result will be a daughter. And I'm not going to go into and for the for the purpose of this discussion uh, and this interview, we're not going to go into the details about the types of radiation or that kind of stuff. Um, but but, but that would be for a, a more technical study. And so uh, what they've done, what scientists have done, is that they, they've measured how long, the, uh, how quickly does this decay process take place? Okay. And so uh, the, uh, the, uh, they they want to know like how long would a with this unstable uh, sample last. And so um, they, they, they did the calculations, they did their measurements, and they, uh, and they uh, established what would be considered to be a half-life, which uh, uh, and a half-life uh, uh, follows a exponential decay uh, pattern where, um, where, where the, the, the more of a substance it has, the quicker it decays, and the less there is, the slower it decays, or, or, or the, uh, the, the less there is to uh, break down. And uh, and uh, so a half life is the um, is the amount of time it takes for half of a substance to decay according to an exponential um, decay rate. Okay, so uh, a way to visualize this is to, um, is to if you have like a sample of carbon fourteen, which has about a five thousand seven hundred thirty year uh, half life. So if you have your full sample of carbon fourteen, after five thousand seven hundred thirty years, you have uh, what we, which, which is one half life. You will uh, you'll have half of that initial carbon-14, and then the rest of it will be uh, normal nitrogen, which we cannot actually distinguish from normal atmosphere. After, after two of these half-lives, 11,460 years, we only have one, one quarter of the carbon left, and three quarters of what's there is now back to normal nitrogen. And then uh, for, like, for carbon dating, the maximum range is about 60, 70,000 years, which is about 10 to 12 half-lives. Okay. Okay, so these equations follow the exponential decay uh, equation, and uh, which is basically the, the number of parent isotopes remaining uh, will be equal to the uh, uh, original amount of parent isotopes uh, for when this clock was set. We'll deal with, with clock setting later. And uh, but but you also need to know the number of daughter isotopes in order to, be able to determine this original amount. Okay, and then uh, and then it's multiplied by a uh, 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 by the uh, a, a, a natural the natural x one e. Uh, which is raised to the uh, the decay constant k, and uh, and then the, and then the theoretical age of the sample, and then by determining the uh, what we have now to what we should have had originally, we can determine how much time has progressed. Okay, and uh, anyone can just kind of just get onto Google and uh, look up radio exponential decay function or a radioactive decay function, and you'll come up with this equation. Okay, and uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on with it. Now, there's some uh, essential assumptions that go into this. Okay, and to make sure I'm not going too, going too far ahead of myself here. Okay, there are four key uh, assumptions that go into these methods that uh, the that the uh, uh, the younger creation groups are, are are known for bringing up. First is you have to know what the initial amount of parent isotope is. What was in the original sample when the uh, when the clock got set or when the when the rock was formed? Okay, you got to know how much daughter isotope was there. Okay, and, and then there's a whole there's a whole lot of factors with that. Uh, you, they have to assume that there's, there's a constant decay rate. 
Okay, and and that's where uh, uh, uniformitarian pr uh, principles come in. So nothing can alter the decay rate with any kind of significance. And to suggest that it uh, stays the same over the span of billions of years is uh, very um, skeptical at best. And we're going to go, go into that in a lot more detail in our fourth session. You also have to assume that it's a closed system. So you can't have any, any of these isotopes leaching in or out of the system. And earthquakes and water flow does a really good job at keeping uh, at preventing this from happening. So ultimately, there can be no changes in the system of any kind other than the uh, parent decaying into the daughter. That's the only thing that that they are that that they can allow in order to make these dating methods have any meaning. Okay, and then again, for practical purposes, we really can only use up to ten to twelve half lives of measurements. Because at that point, we're down to uh, one, uh, about one one thousandth or one fourth four thousandth of the original amount of our isotopes. And uh, our technologies really don't uh, cover that uh, very well because we're dealing with such tiny amounts to begin with. So in my studies, uh, I, 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 I've done a uh, my main analysis has been on uh, uranium lead dating, potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium and then car and then uh, carbon dating. And then, uh, and then, so, and then, uh, so, uh, uranium to lead has a half life of about 4.5 million years. Okay. Or, or, or this 4.5 billion years. And what, and, uh, and, and according to, uh, to, to my data tables, uh, the dating range is about, uh, you, you, this method could, uranium lead could be dated from uh, something as recent as 10 million years ago to 4.6 billion years ago. Potassium argon, uh, has a half life of 1.3 million years. And um, we could date something as young as 50,000 years ago or to 4.6 billion years ago. Rubidium strontium has a half-life of uh, 47 billion years. And then its dating range is also 10 to 4.6 billion years. Now, that caught my attention is that we got three dating methods that all have half-lives of millions of years and, and thousands of millions of years. And they all stop at 4.6 mil, uh, billion years which just so happens to be the the supposed age of the earth. So my question is, why would a dating method suddenly stop being usable according to the story's history of the age of the earth? So something's immediately wrong with that. And then carbon dating uh, is useful for theoretically uh, as something as young as 100 years to 70,000 years ago. Okay, so that's kind of the nutshell of what radiometric dating is, kind of how it started and where we're currently at today. That's pretty interesting, Charlie. So you mentioned a few of the founding figures who were actually involved in looking at the methods and then designing them. When we look at the present state of the methods, the 21st century dating methods, how do they work? Have they changed at all over the course of their history or have they remained semi-constant? So the, the methods themselves really haven't changed that much. There's variety, the variety within the methods. OK, uh, each individual method has its own like starting conditions, its own uh, limitations on on what we look for, what we measure. There's variations within that. But the overall core principles of these methods have not changed since since their inception. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so for uh, for the most of the methods, they're still measuring amount of parent isotopes. They're still measuring daughter isotopes, determining the ratio and doing the math. That's really what it boils down to. OK. Uh, there are different te different te te techniques that have developed since, and a, pr a primary one that uh, I, I, I started looking into this, but I haven't really covered this in enough detail to start teaching about it. But it's called isochron dating, and um, uh, 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 Vernon Cups uh, uh, has this book called uh, 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 Let's see, uh, I don't have, I, but my book's packed up, but it's a uh, 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 rethinking uh, uh, re rethinking radiometric dating, or I, th I think that's what it's called. And, uh, and uh, he addresses isochron dating in a little more detail. He's a, a, a nuclear engineer that writes for ICR. Okay, so uh, that, that's what I, I have to study a little bit more before I really uh, uh, speak about it. But the, the uh, general concept is that uh, they have a that, that they, they take a uh, the, the radioactive uh, isotope and the daughter and compare it to a stable isotope and uh, and uh, a stable daughter, and then that they uh, showcase how over time the uh, uh, the, the the two ratios uh, should uh, line up, and then another uh, variation in the technique is what Wood Libby put together with carbon dating, 
And, and the issue with carbon dating is that we can't actually measure how much daughter isotope it is because the daughter nitrogen is completely indistinguishable between our, with our atmospheric nitrogen. Okay, so the, so the way that they so the way they measure that is uh, they, they compare how much carbon fourteen they have now compared to how much car, carbon fourteen there should have been uh, uh, when it finished uh, uh, when it fin when the animal or plant or tree or whatever uh, 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 would, would, would have last had carbon fourteen inputs. So so uh, so that's how they do, do those comparisons. And there's and I'll address when we I get, get into carbon dating a little bit later. Uh, we'll address that there's major problems with, with those theories too. So Charlie, it sounds like you've been saying that the methods haven't exactly changed per se, but there's a variety of them to choose from. And so before we close out this first session, can you please tell us, I know you sort of touched on this already in question five, but how exactly is it that radiometric dating methods work? The, the big idea is that they, 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 uh, they figure out the ratio of the unstable isotope into and the daughter isotope. Okay, so, so uh, they, they, they figure out how much of their uh, 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 of the parent, how much is there of the daughter. Uh, they compare it to what the starting conditions should have been, and they just crunch numbers to determine uh, how far back it goes. Okay, and again, there's a lot of pro a lot of issues that deal with it, and one of the assumptions that often isn't mentioned. Is that they assume that there's a, a uniformity distribution of these isotopes within a sample, okay? Because like one of the things that they that one of the uh, uh, encounters that, that that I've heard is that uh, they found a woolly mammoth, and uh, one half of the mammoth dated one age, the other half of the ma mammoth dated another age, and so that's a problem. And but the method requires that there's be a uniform distribution of this. Well, that's not necessarily true. You, you take a piece of pottery. There might be more carbon fourteen in one piece, one part of the pot, of the pot, of, of the broken pot, and the more and less carbon dating in another piece of pot. That and so, unless you know the distribution throughout the entire sample, which they can't do without completely destroying the sample, uh, it's yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of issues to to deal with that aren't as uh, publicly acknowledged to be an issue as they say. And so, but so that's the, pretty much the the principle of how they're supposed to work, okay. But and then, and then we're going to be going throughout the uh, throughout these uh, sessions. Do they actually work in that way? Well, Charlie, we've actually now come to the final question of our first session. Earlier, we saw that radiometric dating methods are upholding a narrative. Even so, the Bible has its own narrative of history, ending with the restoration of creation. And so, Charlie, in conclusion, are there reasons to trust the narrative of the Bible? Yeah. So, as I opened up, the whole purpose of this uh, of these dating methods is ultimately to attack the biblical history. That's the ultimate goal. Okay, that's what they're after. And so, it's not this whole debate is not about whether the Earth is six thousand years old or four point six billion years old. Okay, the age itself is really is a secondary issue. What I address is like, how do you get there? Why are you getting there? What's your methodology? What comes with those those age figures? Okay, it's the whole history that comes with these age figures. Okay, uh, we can summarize the entire debate by saying the Earth is six thousand years old or four point six billion years old, because because when you in order to get there, you have to assume all these other things. Okay, and, and so just by stating uh, how old you believe the Earth is, you're also stating what's your authority, what methods are you using, what, what's your um, uh, what are your techniques and, uh, uh, and, and and stuff? And so the narrative of the Bible really only gives a few thousand years of history today. And it's, the Bible's pretty crystal clear about it. Okay, It's not that hard to understand that's what it's saying. It may be hard to believe it. It may be hard to accept it. It may be hard to swallow it. But it's not hard to figure out that's what it's saying. And so the question is, can we trust the Bible's record? We're going to find out that all these counterclaims have no way in, in and of themselves. And that leaves the Bible's record still standing. But my question uh, uh, still beyond that is a resounding yes. And I even wrote a book about that. One of my books is called uh, uh, 10 Reasons to Believe the Bible. But I go through 10 reasons why the Bible is trustworthy. So uh, I I'll quickly go through the table of contents here because I'm not going to read the whole book. <laughs> we'll, be here for, uh, <laughs> we'll be here for four days if I did that. Okay, but I, I look at the construction of the Bible. How is the Bible put together? Okay, and 
uh, news flash. It wasn't cobbled together by a bunch of uh, old, old, old guys in 300 AD. Okay. The Bible, the, the revelation of the Bible reveals that it can only have come from, from God. It contains things that man could not figure out on their own. Okay. The prophecies of the Bible, that's always a big one. 2,000 plus prophecies that have been fulfilled to the exact letter. Okay. With 100% accuracy. And the remaining 500 look a lot like today's headlines. Okay. Uh, the opposition against the Bible, and I'll, I'll, we'll be addressing this uh, quite a bit throughout these sessions too. Uh, the, the world is hell bent against refuting the Bible's history, uh, the Bible's integrity, and it, and it's singularly focused. They don't attack the other religions that are against their ideas either. Okay, uh, the preservation of the Bible, how we got the Bible to today. And and the way the way the Bible has been preserved only shows that God's hand had to be upon it. Okay, the relevance of the Bible uh, is just as relevant today as it was two thousand years ago when it was complete, if not more so. The accuracy of the Bible in every topic the Bible has touched, has spoken on, it, it has proven to be accurate every step of the way. Okay, and I go through science, I go through archaeology, I go through all kinds of things. The honesty of the Bible. The Bible says a lot of things that anyone trying to sell a story would never say. There's a talking donkey in this in this book. <laughs> okay, who would put that in there? This is not the Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> yeah, and so like yeah, it does a lot of stuff doesn't make sense. But who would put that in there unless they were trying to tell the truth? Okay, the public affirmation of the Bible. This is especially uh, relevant to, to the New Testament, but uh, the events of the Bible were were seen and witnessed publicly including by hostile witnesses. And then, uh, and then lastly, the, the testimony of the saints. People who believe this book give their lives on the line and endure all kinds of horrors and tortures and stuff to, and would not give up anything about this book. Why would they do that unless they absolutely knew that this book was true? So uh, that, that's just a real quick uh, summary of, of my book, 10 Reasons to Believe the Bible. Can we trust the Bible's record? Completely without question, resounding yes. Amen. Charlie, thank you very much for your time. It was an absolute joy. And to our listeners, thank you very much for taking the time to learn with us on current topics in science, where scientific discoveries are examined in light of the origins issue. You can find Charlie's website, his autobiographical information, his books, and his other resources in the description below. Please share and subscribe to the Current Topics in Science podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth saves.